So now that you know a little bit about the Java Thread lifecycle, let's take a deep dive into the state machine for Java Threads. And we'll see all the various states that a thread can be in when it runs. So a Java Thread can be in various states during its lifecycle, although it can only be in one given state at a time. And that really, in some sense, is the definition of a state machine, if you think about it. So here is a nice visual depiction of the states in the Java state machine. You can read more about this if you take a look at the link below. It, it was for Java 6, but things really haven't changed a lot in the intervening releases with respect to threading. Threads begin, of course, when you make a new thread. So let's say you've made your own thread class called MyThread that is going to extend thread. And then you or someone comes along and says, new my thread. So what happens in that case is the thread then transitions to the new state. So we're in the new state. Now, not much interesting is going on at that point, but we're in the new state. At some point, someone will call start on the thread. If they never call start on the thread, then we never progress any further in the state machine um, sequence. But if they call start, then a new runtime stack is going to be created. And that will then effectively launch or spawn the thread. And at that phase, it'll then transition into the so-called runnable state. And you'll see the runnable state actually occurs a lot in the life cycle of a thread. And what runnable says is it says, this thread is now available to be given to a core to be run. It doesn't mean it's running. It just means that it's available to be given to the uh, a core to run. And the responsible entity in the overall full stack that does this would be a scheduler, most typically going to be the operating system scheduler like Android Linux scheduler if you're on Android, or the um, GNU Linux scheduler if you're on Linux, or the Windows scheduler if you're on Windows, and so on and so forth. And the reason that we need the scheduler to do this is that there could be a whole bunch of threads that are waiting to run, but we only have a limited number of cores. So we have to be, the scheduler has to be judicious in which core it's going to allow to run at any given, uh, which thread it'll allow to run on the set of cores at any given point. When a scheduler or when the scheduler selects a thread to execute, it will transition to the running state and it'll call the run hook method. And of course, you should all be familiar with the run hook method. That's where the, the quote, the business logic goes that does whatever the thread has been set up to do. And this is typically implemented by or invoked by the Java execution environment, the Java virtual machine, the Dalvik interpreter, the art, Android runtime, et cetera, et cetera. So when the run hook method gets called back, then interesting things happen that will also have effects on the thread states. So one thing that a thread can do after it's started to run is it might do something that involves timed waiting. So for example, it might call sleep. It might call wait with a timeout. It might call join with a timeout. And these methods will then cause that thread to be suspended for some period of time either when something happens or when the timeout period elapses. When these calls are made by the application code in the context of the run hook method or anything that run hook method calls, then we go into the timed waiting state. So the thread is now in timed waiting. And after the wait time elapses or the operation occurs, then we can go ahead and continue and we continue by becoming runnable again. So what that means is once you're out of the timed waiting state, you don't automatically start to run, but you're available to be run. And then it's the job of the scheduler again to select which of the runnable threads can be transitioned to running. So when the scheduler says now you're running again, it'll pick up where it left off after the timed wait returns, so after sleep returns, or after timed wait returns, or after time join returns, and so on. And now it'll be in the running state again. So it's then off doing its thing. And while it's doing its thing, it might attempt to obtain a guarded resource. For example, a, a monitor's intrinsic lock would be an example of a guarded resource. And if that resource is currently owned by another thread of control that's operating in the critical section in the monitor, for example, then that's going to cause the thread to transition into the blocked state. And of course, when it's in the blocked state, it's going to be put to sleep, just like when it was in the timed wait state, and it'll be suspended until it unblocks. Now the resource, when the resource is made available to the thread, 
for example, when the lock becomes available and this thread is the next one to get it or is the one to get it, uh, then the block thread can acquire the resource. And once again, it transitions back into the runnable state, but again, doesn't start to run immediately. And at some point, the schedule will pick that particular thread to be run again. Interestingly enough, the thread state for blocking IO is runnable. <laughs> and you can read more about this if you take a look at the link at the bottom of the page. So, so blocked in this context refers really to waiting on something like a, a synchronizer, such as the, the intrinsic lock, as opposed to blocking on IO. Once the scheduler decides this guy can run again, then it transitions the thread back into the running state, and the run hook method picks up from where it left off after the blocking operation return. For example, it now has access to the critical section of a monitor object, and it'll keep doing its thing. And then there's also yet another state, which is the waiting state, or the non-timed waiting state. And this occurs when a thread calls wait on its monitor condition, on the intrinsic condition, uh, assuming that the monitor lock, of course, has already been acquired. And that will, again, suspend the thread. So once it suspends itself on wait, it then transitions into the waiting state. And then at some point, conceivably, some other thread will come along and call notify or notify all on that monitor object. And that will cause that monitor condition to wake up. And then assuming all goes well and it's able to satisfy its condition expression, it will then once again be able to transition back to runnable. Although there may be a, a stop along the way um, to, to the blocked state if it has to reacquire the lock. When we're finally back in the runnable state, then the scheduler can pick that thread at some point to run. Now it's going to be running again. And picked up where it left off after it returned from wait. And then at some point, we're going to terminate the thread. And there's a couple different ways to do this. One is just to fall off the end of, of run in a normal way. And of course, the other way to do this is if an exception is not handled, in which case we'll also fall off <laughs> the run uh, method, run hook method, although it'll be a bit more um, abrupt and perhaps less graceful than falling off the run method the normal way. So at that point, at long last, we have reached the terminated state. And once we're in the terminated state, then the Java execution environment can reclaim the thread's resources and basically put those resources back to be reused by other threads or other parts of the program that needs to access the system uh, capabilities that are provided in a multi-threaded program in Java. So that's the end of the discussion of the state machine for Java threads. I think you'll see through that discussion, that very detailed discussion, there's a lot of moving parts to a thread. And therefore, as we'll talk about a little bit later when we get into the analysis part of this whole lesson, you have to use threads judiciously. Don't just spawn them willy-nilly to do very short-running operations. Spawn them when there's a need to do something that's going to run for a while.